I hope we all gain weight during this quarantine. I wish weight gain not upon you specifically, or even this community. I wish weight gain upon us all. The globe is one. I hope that when social distancing is relaxed and people flock to the beaches, normal bodies, ones that aren't maintained through obsessive crossfitting and vegan paleo diets become normalized. I hope the term bikini body becomes just that, a body wearing a bikini. I hope that people are forced to stay home and stay away from gyms. We discover other hobbies we'd rather spend our time doing. I hope we realize that when we can't find diet foods and are forced to eat full fat products, nothing bad happens to us. I hope we realize how futile and fleeting the patriarchy-fueled diets are. I hope we realize how the diet industry profits from all of our insecurities. I hope that when we can no longer talk about our workout regimes and diets, we realize how safe at home, we realize that our body is perfect and safe no matter what. I hope we never return to feeling pressured to diet or lose weight or work out ever again. I hope we talk about how to help others and come together and pursue our true passions instead of waste our time and obscure our values by focusing on food. Extra period. I hope this is one silver lining of the pandemic and all the deaths. That we realize when we die, no one will care about or remember the size of our body. I hope we all realize that in this time, when it feels like the world might actually be ending, gaining weight is so far from being the end of the world. Extra period. So yes, I hope we all gain weight during this time. Heart, extra period, extra period. Grillard replied, I hope that the people who survived this global tragedy are as fat as me so I can feel good about myself. We need more characters in mainstream media who are athletic to prove you can be fat and healthy. I may be 400 pounds, but I can still kick your butt. Right in water replied, I'm pretty sure that anyone who, like Reagan, tries to be both 400 pounds and athletic will find out really fast that obesity won't let you anywhere near athletic status. You can't move your body quickly or easily if your arms can barely bend at the elbows. A guy holding a sign. Stop posting your workouts at home. Be like the dude with the sign. Contrary to popular belief, it's okay to exercise without telling everyone on social media. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's encouraged. If you want to use your time in social isolation to exercise, be my guest. Just think before you broadcast it all over the internet. Not only is this unhelpful for many people like myself, frankly, no one cares how many push-ups you did today. Grotri replied, well, let me fix that for you. Contrary to popular belief, it's okay to be salty without telling everyone on social media. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, it's encouraged. If you want to use your time in isolation to be salty, be my guest. Just think before you broadcast it all over the internet. Not only is this unhelpful, for many people like myself, frankly, no one cares how salty you are today. Your jokes about weight gain during quarantine are, one, not funny, two, triggering for those in recovery or trying to recover from eating disorders, three, adding to body hatred, exercise obsession, fat phobia, weight stigma, and development of eating disorders, four, adding to the anxiety of the current situation, the waves of stress we all feel in this worldwide moment of much unknown, five, not funny. Lindsay Tall replied, I find it distasteful to see intuitive eatings post about the abundance of comfort foods they're allowing themselves to eat. When some people are facing true food scarcity in the form of empty shelves at the grocery store and disappearing paychecks. In a post about coronavirus death rate and obesity factor, you misspelled poverty. You don't become obese because of poverty. You become obese because you consume more calories than what your body needs. In other words, you can't become obese without paying more money to eat more food. Check your privilege, Karen. Cheap, empty calorie foods like Cheetos, soft drink, and all fast food are cheaper on average than healthy food. The more empty calories you eat, the hungrier you get because your body is driving you to look for more food to fill its vitamin and mineral budget that crappy ultra-processed four doesn't have. Obese people are obese because they are starving for nutrition while piling on fat, because we pay them peanuts and feed them garbage food so we don't have to give a poop about them. Remember when Gwyneth Paltrow tried to feed her family healthy? On the average poverty-stricken family's weekly food budget? She effing failed. I've been poor, and trust me, unless all you eat is rice and beans five times a day, you can buy a ton more good-tasting poop food than bland food that is actually good for you. Also, it's a proven fact poor areas receive less competent and thorough medical care, 
and thus follow up the wealthy ones. Poor areas with unhealthy residents are hardest hit because they are given bad food, no health education, and their medical facilities are underfunded and understaffed with underqualified medical personnel. Check my privilege? I'm living in Turkey. Average monthly income in my country is 300 United States dollars. You don't need to eat healthy to not become obese. You just need to consume less calories than your body needs. You can eat a McDonald's cheeseburger without any sides and without any sugar drinks three times a day and still lose weight. If you want to lose weight, there's no excuses. It's just a simple math equation. Also, in modern society, you need to work hard to become mineral or vitamin deficient. Don't come up with that. Da, poor baby. You're either a privileged American slumming for social justice points by voluntarily moving to a hellhole like Turkey, or you're a Turkish citizen whose only view of America is through what pop culture makes it past the censors. Either way, your opinion on what life is like for the poor in America is biased and worthless. Cries in planes and trains replied. From actual science. White women, low and middle income, have the same exact obesity rate. Black women, all levels of income, have roughly the same obesity rate. Hispanic women, lower income, have a higher obesity rate, but it's really about the same across all income levels. Asian women, this is the only demographic that shows clearly the stereotypical pattern of getting thinner as you get wealthier. It's also the smallest of the eight demographics compared. White men, middle income has the highest obesity rate. Black men, have a reverse pattern where the wealthier the member, the lower their obesity rate. Hispanic men, middle income, the fattest rate. Asian men, all the same, basically. Outside of Asian women, there is no demographic where there's a significant number of fat pores compared to the rest of the group. And he cites where he got that information from the CDC. Picture of a mommy hippo with two babies. The big mommy hippo is labeled, my fat butt. One of the babies is labeled, a child we don't force to be skinny to prove that fat people can raise healthy children. The other child is just called another child. Another hippo is labeled my fat spouse. In reality, I don't have kids and I don't know if I ever would want kids. However, if I ever have children, you can bet that I'm not going to try to use them as a pawn in order to prove something to fat phobic people. I see this too often, a fat person will use self-loathing and fat phobic language to pressure their child into becoming thin and weight obsessed. They will then use that child in order to gain clout from thin people. Honestly, it's gross, and making your child so obsessed with weight is a good way to start an eating disorder. Silent Avox replied, Ah yes, nothing says I love my kids more than 1. Not having kids. 2. Using said non-existent kids to virtue signal. 3. Push the idea that you would not want the kids to succeed where you failed. A liposuction study that controlled for behavioral change found no improvement in health problems that get blamed on obesity, despite weight loss that occurred. Because clap, weight, clap, itself, clap, isn't clap, the clap, cause clap. In the book Healthy at Every Size, Lindo Bacon uses an analogy. Smokers have a much higher rate of developing and dying from lung cancer than non-smokers. Smokers also develop yellow teeth. If we treated lung cancer like we do the ailments we see associated with body size, by prescribing weight loss, we would just whiten those yellow teeth and ta-da, no more lung cancer. Except that's ridiculous, right? We know it's not yellow teeth that causes lung cancer, but they are correlated. Same with weight. As it currently stands, not a single piece of research can prove weight is the cause of poorer health. It can only show correlation, and that's a very big distinction. Where things get muddy is when some people lose weight, their health may improve. But the question is, how did they lose the weight? And what did they change? Because there's evidence that certain behavioral changes, like moving more, reducing stress, eating more nutritionally dense foods, can improve health, and weight loss may happen at the same time. So we earnestly chalk it up to weight, but here's the most important part. These health improvements can be seen with these behavior changes without weight loss happening. So what we need to know about weight and health is that it's much more complex than we want to believe. If we really want to improve people's health, we must end this discrimination and stigma we have against body size and actually make changes in our greater society that improves health for all. For information and resources on a weight-inclusive approach to health, check out my stuff, and I definitely am going to try to sell you something. Cries in planes trains replied, Okay, let's pretend it's not obesity that causes health issues. It's whatever causes obesity that causes health issues. Well, that is easy. It's eating too much and moving too little. 
So in order to fix the problem of eating too much and moving too little, you get the side effect of losing weight. Just like if you cut out what causes both yellow teeth and lung issues, you stop smoking. Sarozek added, If they substituted their incredible mental gymnastics with the real gymnastics, they'd be thin in no time. I'm an RN who takes care of COVID-19 patients. An experience I had with one of them has completely reshaped how my brain thinks about food and life. This is a throwaway account to protect my identity and employer. I'm willing to provide proof if mods request it. I work as an RN in a rather densely populated suburban hospital in the Northeast US. A couple of weeks ago, we started getting COVID-19 cases in my unit. All of these patients we considered rule out, as in we literally didn't have the tests to swab them with, so we were forced to assume they had the disease if they were showing symptoms. So far, the large majority of these patients were negative and sent home. Great news! However, that doesn't mean we haven't had our share of positives. These patients can seem okay, but a small number of them can slowly deteriorate. I had experience with one of them. He was a rather healthy and active 40-ish year old male. Slightly overweight, slightly hypertensive, high blood pressure. He was complaining of a little bit of a sharp pain in his chest when breathing in. Otherwise, he was stable. We were just giving him a little oxygen. The next night with him, he was on a little more oxygen because his oxygen saturation started dropping, but otherwise stable. The next night, he couldn't breathe if he talked for more than a few sentences at a time. Very bad sign. But again, still stable otherwise. In the back of my head, I knew he was going to deteriorate further, and probably would need to be intubated and attached to a ventilator eventually. I gave him our breathing treatments with little effect. I increased his oxygen with little effect. But again, he was still stable. I informed the doctors of this so they were aware, but there was really nothing further we could do for him at that point, as I had given him every appropriate medication and intervention. Close to the end of my shift, his call light went off and I can hear him in the room absolutely gasping for air. Without even going in the room, I called for rapid response, the emergency team in the hospital. Mind you, it takes a solid two minutes just to get inside these rooms with all the PPE, gloves, gown, and 95 mask and face shield were required to wear. By the time I got in, his lips were blue, he's gasping for air, and absolutely begging to breathe normally. He was immediately intubated by the hospitalist and sent to the ICU. He's currently sedated, intubated, on a ventilator, and on a rotoprone bed. A bed that rotates you like a rotisserie chicken to move accumulated fluid in your lungs. I currently have no idea if he'll make it through this. I understand that this was only my first patient for this to happen to. There are going to be tens, hundreds more, most likely. But it's already completely changed me. I'm a big guy. I've always been overweight. I'm 6 foot 2, 285 pounds, and have the same body type and a couple of the same comorbidities as that patient. Hearing that COVID-19 affects people with hypertension and obesity harder than other people scares the absolute poop out of me after seeing it firsthand. We're being forced to reuse PPE, only the N95 masks at this point, so I know I'm most likely going to be exposed to this disease at some point. I used to binge eat after work to calm the stress. Now the thought of eating an entire frozen pizza or an entire bag of chips absolutely disgusts me to my core. I know that I'm at increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and other terrible diseases, but COVID-19 is a slowly progressing, agonizing disease. It has completely scared me straight. I understand it's sad that it's taken this crisis for me to care about myself, but it's forced me to reevaluate what is important in life. I guess as an RN, I've always thought about others before myself. But this has made me realize that I want to live. I want to be healthy. If I get sick, I don't want it to be because I didn't care for myself. I want it to be because it was my time and knowing that I did everything I could for myself. I've been counting my calories. I've been eating way more salads, grilled chicken, rice, vegetables, and I feel great. I've lost seven pounds in the past week. With the quarantine situation, I've been taking more walks outside in the fresh air, which is great for my mental health. I know the weight loss will slow over time, but I'm in this for the long haul. Also, younger people, you are not immune. Take this disease deadly serious, because it is deadly. Don't play the COVID ventilator lottery because you want to go out drinking or have a night out. Your night out is not worth tying up a ventilator for two to three weeks to keep you alive instead of someone else. Home Alone 2 replied, My wife is an EDRN at a busy facility in Metro Atlanta and says many of the younger people impacted she's seen are obese and usually really sick. I used to be fairly plump, Lost it, but smoke and have asthma, so there's that. Big Merce added, Not in the ED, but that's been my experience as well. Obese and elderly patients being hit particularly hard. A large percentage of Chinese men in China are smokers. 
And the reports coming out of that country say the mortality rate for men is much higher than the women who don't smoke. Quarantine is a great time to have an excuse to not go to the store to get your next pack. Thin privilege is buying a standard size camping chair at a big box store. We're going camping in September. There's a $150 set of two camping chairs in my Amazon cart because none of the standard sized inexpensive camping chairs will comfortably support our weight. Fat folks deserve not to pay triple the amount thin folks pay for a portable chair. And fat folks deserve not to be sacrificed constantly on the altars for profit. Because of course a smaller chair that excludes many bodies is more profitable than creating chairs that fit all bodies. This is a serious post on thin privilege and how it affects all of us in our daily life. If you're not familiar with the concept of thin privilege, please Google and do some reading before engaging here. Never mind it then replied. For starters, buying possibly one-time use furniture as supplies for your vacation is its own type of privilege. The extra cost of a different chair is likely a small percentage of the vacation's overall cost. Second, there are no chairs that fit all bodies. They always seem to think that larger equals better without stopping to consider the fact that some people cannot use some items that are too large for them, just as some people cannot use items that are too small for them. A chair designed for a 300 to 400 pound person would have a seat depth too large for me to be able to sit in it properly, for instance. Standard sized chairs are undoubtedly more inclusive overall. For anyone that's familiar with intuitive eating, practicing it, how do you practice intuitive eating body positivity on a budget? Like I'll go to the store and get my groceries for the week, but then I'll crave something later in the week that I didn't purchase. I want to honor my craving, and I know ignoring it and telling myself I can't have it will only make it worse but I literally can't have it. I don't have the money to go out and buy every single craving I have. Eventually, I do give in and buy it and then binge. I really can't afford to keep doing this as I have to keep taking money out of my savings because of these binges. Similarly, I want to love my body and believe I'm just fine at the weight I am, but none of my clothes really fit and again, I can't afford to buy more. Is trying to lose weight acceptable in this case? Please help, I'm struggling. Johnny Chainsaw replied. Spending money you can't afford in order to satisfy a craving is called addiction. That's from personal experience. Lady Merle added, She seems like she's perfectly capable of ignoring her cravings. and would rather do so, but is scared of being shunned by the tribal chiefs. Johnny Chainsaw, I mean, let's not pretend that this whole cult isn't just apologists for high-calorie food addiction. Here's an honest question, though. I don't feel great when I'm overweight, like right now. My joints ache and I'm not eating healthy. The only way I know to lose weight is to diet. I want to not diet, but I also don't want to be this size. Sending lots of compassion to both of you. I tackle this question on episode 225, but briefly, when we feel discomfort in our larger body, it's usually entangled with our own internalized weight stigma. So it's not just the weight itself that is causing it, if it's even the weight at all. Even if it was, as I share in my post, we don't have a safe and effective way for people to lose weight. Instead, what might benefit is managing your health concerns in a weight-inclusive way. For joint pain, it might be physiotherapy, orthotics, resting, and or medication. For not eating healthy, it might be healing your relationship with food. Virtual spread replied. So your joints hurt because you carry a sack of cement with you all the time? No, don't put that sack down. It's not the sack that's causing pain. It's the internalized stigma against carrying the sack. Instead, take an aspirin and rest. By the way, I got rid of my excruciating joint pains by losing 80 pounds. I tried everything mentioned in the post beforehand, and nothing worked. Six alternatives to stepping on your scale. One, hide it in the back of your closet. Two, cover a readout screen with affirmations. Three, throw it in the garbage. Four, ship it to someone you hate. Five, run over it repeatedly with your car. Six, smash it aggressively with a baseball bat. Semi-Pot replied, can't wait for the sequel, Six Alternatives to Testing Your Blood Sugar. Gainer. It's not diabetes, my blood is just fierce. Three Adams. It's not diabetes, I'm just vampire candy. LMAO, it's funny because I've been dieting for three weeks now and I've lost 12 pounds. Diets do work. It's just that people like you just want to eat 24 whole pizzas then even try a salad. Shaking my head. Could I ask what your plan has been? I'm kind of struggling. Most diets work in the short term. I used to be a competitive bodybuilder, lol. I know diets work temporarily, but within two to five years, 95% of diets regain the weight they've lost and up to 66% of dieters regain more weight than they ever lost. 
please don't listen to what this person is eating. We all have different needs, and losing weight in three weeks means nothing. Any diet is going to show short-term weight loss, but it's almost always followed by weight regain and usually more of it. I'm a registered dietitian. I used to travel the country to compete as a very high-level bodybuilder and have recovered from eating disorders. Not to toot my own horn, but I've got much more schooling and personal experience than someone claiming they've dieted first three weeks. Yes, diets will work. Temporarily. I dieted frequently and heavily for bodybuilding. But it's temporary. Honor and respect your body. Listen to what it tells you. If diets don't work, what can I do to lose weight? There is no long-term way to keep weight off. If you want to lose weight for health purposes, you can change your relationship with food. Health isn't determined by weight. In fact, weight loss diets make our health worse. Changing our relationship with food isn't about changing our weight, but it does improve health. If it's about looking better, that's a different story. That usually requires some inner work. Maybe because every body type is different, and some people are predisposed to settling at a lower weight, while other bodies are more likely to hold on to weight in certain places or stay at a higher weight. Everyone has different bone structures and muscle mass. Some people have larger busts and wider hips and can weigh the same as someone smaller but won't necessarily look like they do. Also, weight has zero bearing on a person's health. Like Blank said, every body and person has different needs. If there was one diet for everybody, the diet industry wouldn't bank so much money and people wouldn't struggle to find food normalcy in their lives. What you're touting is dangerous, uninformed, and wrong. Preach, thanks girl. This bubble has been blocked. Nazanin88 replied, If you want to lose weight for health purposes, you can change your relationship with food? If only there was a term for this phenomenon. 1. Maybe. 2. You're comparing a body type to a habit. Most people with alcohol addictions can work to overcome it. Fatness is an inherent characteristic of most fat people. Alcohol addiction is harmful to oneself and others. Fatness is just a body type C. So you're saying fatness is something that's outside of a human's control and is not harmful to oneself? Yes, that's what accumulated research and the lived experience of fat people have confirmed for decades. Why are you posting fatphobic comments in a feminist group? Maybe Sadai replied, Because fat acceptance is not feminism? Karzan6300 added, Killing women is not a feminist act, and obesity-related health complications kill a lot of women. And men, of course, too. Just don't exercise too much because that stuffs your immune system and leaves you with insufficient body fat that you might need if you can't eat for a few weeks. Lejan Sharta, 93. A couple of years ago, I got really sick and couldn't eat properly for six months. I lost 30 kilograms, 66 pounds, and suffered severe dehydration and nutritional deficiencies with horrible long-term effects. One person I know keeps using this as an example of why we need extra fat on our bodies and on our pets' bodies. While I agree that having some fat is good, it makes me mad that people use these extreme situations as an excuse for being obese. What happened to me is very unlikely to happen to anyone. Plus, it wouldn't have been so bad if I had received sufficient medical help sooner. Not stuffing my face with junk food all the time has, however, cured me of hypertension, gotten rid of my PCOS symptoms, and gotten my insulin resistance under control. I have not allowed myself to regain those 30 kilograms. Sanity. This spark in at-home workouts and obsession with not gaining weight during a pandemic is really showing just how fatphobic everyone is. How on earth is anyone taking care of their physical health and the comfort of their own home equal to fatphobia? Are they forcing you to join them? Also, consistent care of your physical health links to an improvement in mental health, which is also very important. Glorified Plumber replied, Or maybe it's showing how people are dedicated to their own physical well-being and their dedication upsets you because you can't manage the same. Hey world, your memes, jokes, and comments about gaining weight during this time of isolation are fatphobic and rooted in shame. Guess who is not here for it? Me! It's mean. It's poopy. It's only funny if you think fat is bad and the punchline is a joke, which if you do, just unfriend yourself right now. And there's literally nothing you could tell me otherwise. Especially if you are a thin or average sized person posting it. From this moment on, if you post that stuff, I will simply unfriend you. I don't have the bandwidth for arguments or attempting to educate people. You should know better by now. And furthermore, you can't be fatphobic and be my friend. These things are mutually exclusive. Edit, in case I wasn't exceptionally clear, this is not open for discussion. If you disagree, unfriend me. I don't want to hear your thoughts. This is rooted in exceptional love for myself, for the world. 
I hear you. And can people possibly have their own experiences? I am having issues with weight gain now. That is about me and my experience and I want to share about it sometimes. We're all doing the best we can in this unprecedented time. Maybe people need some education in this area. And compassion also goes a long way. Not sure shaming people and cutting them off helps in either of these areas. What part of there is literally nothing you can tell me otherwise made you think that what you wrote here was appropriate? Perhaps turn that compassion on the people who are fat and have to be subjected to a barrage of fat jokes. Nope, they don't get to be fat phobic and post fat phobic things and be my friend or get connected to me on any level. I have offered lots of education and people continue to make jokes. My wanting nothing to do with that for my mental health is not shaming. I am not here to dole out compassion to people who make fun of me and my body. Nope, and that comes from a deep wellspring for myself and the world around me. There's a very good possibility that your issue with any current weight gain comes from a societal fat phobia. If the worst outcome of this for you and others is that you might look more like me, I don't want to hear it. None of this is open for any more discussion. I am and was clear. If you want to take the stance, you are more than welcome to unfriend me. 864-8675309 replied. One of the fat jokes that set her off said, I need to practice social distancing from the refrigerator. This whole idea that losing part of ourselves to fit some obtuse beauty standard and bigoted projection of what society deems healthy is messed up. Losing weight is almost always traumatic and difficult and revolves around self-injury, you stupid Fs. Deprivation, forced over-exercising pain, loss. It has never been a good thing. Even for the people who are unhealthy at the weight that they are at, try worrying about what a person is using food as medicine to deal with, and maybe they will find ways to stop torturing themselves with it. In either direction, you dumb Fs. Cries and Plains replied. Translation. Obtuse beauty standard. Hot guys that are six feet tall, six figure incomes with six pack abs, and the last six should find me attractive. Not the skinny bee he sees at the gym five days a week. Health. When I go to the doctor for the seventh time this year so far, I don't want to hear I don't have perfect health. Traumatic. I love Oreos more than I love my locomotion. Overexercising. Not watching Tiger King Marathon. Okay, this is fine, but why does the second option have to uphold weight loss as something that is correlated with fun? Can't we just use food without worrying about weight? Plenty of people want to lose weight. This is meant for them to have a healthier mindset about it. Why can't the focus just be on health, LMAO? If your body is meant to lose weight, it will just by changing your habits to a more healthy lifestyle. If you're completely healthy and still not losing weight, maybe your body isn't meant to lose weight. AS123X replied, if you're completely healthy and still not losing weight, it's because you're still eating too many calories. Fixed it for the OP. Mad last with a box. Completely healthy is such a vague, misleading concept. Even healthy foods can be eaten in excess. Just because a little bit of something is good for you doesn't mean a lot is better. Completely healthy should mean maintaining a healthy body fat level. I'm an EMT. We have a lot of frequent flyers who refuse to clean up their act. So they're always calling 911 and treating that as a solution instead of getting their stuff together. Maybe you wouldn't need to keep calling us if you checked your blood sugar more than once a month and stopped eating a diet of fried greasy food that helps keep your blood pressure sky high. There's even a phrase for this, Honda patients. Honda stands for high blood pressure, obese, non-compliant, diabetic, and apathetic. The vast majority of patients I see in a day check off anywhere from two to four of those boxes. Mad Leah Peacecraft replied, I can't tell you how many Hondas I've coded that just give zero Fs about what they're doing to themselves. They want a quick band-aid for whatever's ailing them, at the moment, and then they go right back to abusing their body. They refuse to follow up with the PCP, refuse to take their meds, refuse to change their habits. Anything that would actually improve their situation is just ignored. Electra under the seat added, when I worked as a community pharmacist, those Honda folks were one of the most frustrating customers we had. Like coming twice a year for their diabetes meds and taking a box of 60 that mysteriously lasts half a year. And the government paid for 100% of it, so no excuses. Going straight from the pharmacy to the bakery next door for a cake. Swearing up and down they only had lettuce the day before and nothing else. So their coma-inducing glucose levels were an utter mystery. Crying literally about how they don't know how they are getting fatter. But you probe a little, and lo and behold, the day before they made a batch of bayonets and ate them all. How a blood pressure of 220 over 160 was their normal, and they got extremely aggressive when we said that was anything but normal, and they were at a risk of stroke. 
telling a sob story about how they were going to go blind just for my colleagues to tell me he'd been diagnosed as diabetic in the 1990s and always refused to take any meds or see a doctor. After a diet, the weight comes back because it is a part of your body that has been severed. Losing weight is like scraping your skin. A scab forms and new skin cells grow. Regaining weight is your body healing itself. Dusty Buttocks replied, So, it's no big deal if your foot gets amputated, it'll just grow right back? You do not exist for thinness or even health. You exist, hashtag, for relationship. Ugh, fat phobia is awful, especially when it's Christians doing it. Fix Refugee replied, It appears the seven deadly sins have been repurposed as the seven virtues in the past few years. Greed is good, gluttony is self-care, etc. I'm fat and I'm tired of hearing how you are scared to look like me. Full disclosure, I won't hesitate to delete this post at the first sight of trolls, but I do welcome real discussion. Listen, I get it. Gaining weight is the opposite of what society tells us to do each and every day. It sucks for us all. I appreciate your struggle, but I'm here to tell you about mine. Almost every day I see a post on the sub about how you want to do IE, but don't want to gain weight, or how you've gained weight and feel bad, or how you know that being bigger just isn't good for me. Truth is, these thoughts are incompatible with IE principles, because to truly live the principles of intuitive eating, you have to also be pro-HAES. That means you must expand your mind and imagine that being fat is okay. Hear me again, being fat is okay. It's actually healthier than dieting. It is proven in all the literature, and even further, being fat doesn't make you less of a person. And before you get all bent out of shape, gosh darn it, read all the effing books. Read the books. It should take you less than a week to read the original book by Trubol and Resch. Before you get in the sub and start talking about how terrible it would be to be fat, just effing read it. Just give it a go. The Lake Lay Blue replied, It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single woman in possession of a good cheesecake must be in want of intuitive eating the whole thing in one evening. As God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again, because any hunger at all leads to starvation mode. To eat or not to eat, that is the question. Whether it is nourishing for the tummy to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous diet culture, or by indulging in them. A2, body shaming. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the thin privilege, because Juliet can fit through. Shall I compare thee to a summer pudding? Thou are more joyful and more nourishing. Marley was dead from diabetes to begin with. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly nourished. Thank you very much. Not only do I second what Blank said, I want to offer you some additional facts for you. Not only is there zero evidence to suggest that a higher BMI is a risk factor for COVID, the couple studies that have been done show that there is no difference in mortality risks related to COVID based on BMI. Moreover, higher BMI might even play a protective role against mortality risk related to pneumonia and respiratory failure. I'll find and link the post that says all this so that you can explore it by yourself. Lioness17 replied, First, there is evidence obesity causes COVID mortality rates to increase. Second, the study about people with high BMIs faring better. There is a kernel of truth in that. It was that people who get chronic health problems tend to fare better if they have a few extra pounds on them. A few. In the overweight category, not obese. Then people who are on the lower end of healthy. And people of a healthy weight are less likely to get chronic conditions in the first place. So me at 5'4 and 146 pounds, one pound in the overweight category, I would fare better with cancer than my husband who is 6'2 and 145 pounds, one pound in the healthy range because I have a few extra pounds to burn, but if I was 40 pounds heavier, he'd still be better off. Now is not the time for a diet, nor is any time in my opinion, but especially not now. It won't actually give you back the control or safety you are missing. It certainly won't help your brain function and process your experience. It won't protect you from illness. Do not add the stress of restriction and starvation response to the trauma your body is already experiencing. Eat. You have permission to eat. You deserve to eat. Eat. 
with abandon. Eat with joy. Eat for comfort. Radical, I know. But food is comforting. You deserve to be comforted. You deserve to be nourished. You deserve to stop punishing your body for what it is. We all talk so much about community and being kind to each other during this time of global uncertainty. But be kind to yourself first. Treat yourself with kid gloves. Let yourself be soothed, not punished. Book Hermit. So they want to binge eat in response to a crisis and want everyone else to start and give them permission as well. But everyone else has a messed up relationship with food because saving food for later during a lockdown is totally disordered. I mean, traumatizing. Dieting isn't just problematic because it makes you miserable. It's problematic because how the heck are you supposed to treat someone with dignity and respect if you're torturing yourself so that you don't wake up one day looking like them? If they look like your greatest fear, I'm not asking you to quit dieting for your own happiness, although that might be an added bonus, but I'm asking you to stop dieting for the sake of fat people in your life and or those recovering from eating disorders. You can't make someone feel respected if they embody your worst nightmare. Mimi Q U Truck. Is this person legitimately saying you should stop doing something that makes you happy and doesn't hurt you or anyone else just to stop making them feel bad? What kind of monster wishes for others to be miserable? I think this might be one of the most entitled people I've seen on the sub. I can't help but feel pretty disappointed when a famous actor has a really thin girlfriend or wife. Like, yeah, I know you're famous, but would it kill you to be a representative part of society? Probably. Anani Mokoso replied, Famous actors usually have to keep themselves in pretty good shape. They might be romantically attracted to someone who does the same. The CDC is almost single-handedly the cause for the war on fat people, known best as the obesity epidemic. And for that, I don't trust a word they have to say, or their intentions in the midst of this pandemic. I wrote about it for At Where Your Voice. I came here to yell at you. They're right. Why would anyone trust the Center for Disease Control on information on how to control diseases? Like, what are their credentials? AM0116. All they're doing is trying to brainwash us with their vaccines and darn 5G towers, but HAES people will not become sheep. Obesity is a slur, not a health condition, and food doesn't give you diabetes. You need to educate yourself, dude. Food is food. I recommend you read Anti-Diet. Les Moss, por favor. A cigarette is a cigarette. It's just sitting there. It can't give you lung cancer. Look at it all innocent looking on that table. Same principle. Certain coat. Cigarettes aren't harmful at all. It's the stigma that smokers get in society that leads to disease, just like with obesity. No one died until the CDC began its war on smokers. Begin with this. I give my body permission to be whatever size it is today, tomorrow, forever. I give myself permission to stop fighting my body. The tools I got in the process of learning to love my body have made this pandemic feel manageable to me. I am so grateful to the many who have taught me how to do this. My life's work is returning the favor by sharing this gift with others. You can trust your body. Your body is made of stardust. Your body holds sacred wisdom and old knowledge. Your body knows how to eat, how to cry, how to mourn, how to survive, how to thrive. Surrender is the perfect place to start your practice. Lay down your weapons and your armor. Relief can't wait to embrace you. Bad at Hearthstone. What about all those people who don't survive? Did their bodies just not have any sacred wisdom inside? How does she know that everyone who reads her post has a body with sacred wisdom in it? I don't understand. The Trank. They're killed by fat phobia. She changed my life because she was so skinny and pretty, said no one ever. Slain McDread. This is ridiculous. Thousands of people get inspired to lose weight because of other people's look, athletic abilities. Half Fila. But I bet as many people are inspired by obese people with severe health issues to lose weight. She changed my life because she was having heart problems and was about to lose a leg. Now I eat a balanced diet and live an active lifestyle. Said plenty of people, probably. Anti-apocalypse. And unfortunately for some of us, 
Our lives were changed because people we cared about died far sooner than they ever should have had to, directly due to their obesity. At least with some of us, we lost people to obesity as adults. I saw Tess downplaying the idea that she's going to orphan her children if she doesn't tend to her weight. Effing infuriating. They're her kids, and they're still minors on top of that. Haha, <laughs> you dumb fat haters being dumb fat haters. Horrible woman to be so cavalier about orphaning her own kids. More news from Reuters. Obesity is a major COVID-19 risk factor, says French chief epidemiologist. Overweight people really need to be careful. America at risk due to prevalence of obesity. As many as 17 million French people seriously at risk. Phoenix no more. That is why we're worried about our friends in America, where the problem of obesity is well known, and where they will probably have the most problems because of obesity. Heaven help France and its physicians when F-A-H-A-E-S gets a whiff of this. I can just see the righteous indignation congealing with the obligatory American scorn for France. One of many reasons I am embarrassed for my country. Duxbury. What are they going to do? Boycott French fries? Are we going back to freedom fries? Grillard. Fat fries. Fierce fries. Feminist fries? Positivity potatoes. I love you and I just want you to be healthy. I love you and I just want you to be quiet. Seriously, if I want your thoughts about my health, I'll let you know. Concern trolling is not loving or caring. Fat people's health is not other people's business unless we ask them to make it their business. If people are concerned about fat people's health, they can remember that research has shown that fat phobia is bad for fat people's health and keep their concern to themselves. Of June X. I thought concern trolling is when people who don't actually care about your well-being pretend they do to shame you or, or whatever. I don't think a family member or friend explaining how much they love you and want you to live a long, happy, healthy life is concern trolling. Sean Michael King. They think everyone doesn't actually care, family and friends included. Everyone is out to get fat people. They have to pretend it's always negative and hurtful. It's the only way they can continue to act like victims. They would rather have fake sympathy from other fat people than take advice from actual loved ones. Gotta take the easy way out. Book Hermit. It's a tactic that cult leaders employ to isolate their cult members. Only the cult can make you happy. This is your real family. Your biological family only tells you they love you and want you to be healthy because they want to control you. They don't care about your happiness like the cult. Only we understand. It's difficult to find any major figure in the field of obesity research who does not have some type of financial tie to a pharmaceutical or a weight loss company. Any wonder why diets fail? All the major studies on obesity are all underwritten by pharmaceutical companies or a major player in the diet industry. They're out to prove that obesity is a problem so they can make money. Don't buy into their false claims. There's not an obesity epidemic. It's a fat phobia epidemic. Benjo83. And it's impossible to find a HAES that isn't selling anything. At least the obesity researchers have regulatory and ethical standards to meet. Newsflash! Most of the people selling you fitness and wellness are naturally thin and using that thin privilege to take advantage of you. Throw back to this oldie but goodie. So, yeah, you know those influencers you follow that swear by the workout they promote and make money off of? They probably don't even do it. That woman who eats keto and swears she was able to do it throughout her pregnancy and breastfeed without issues? Probably not true. What about the one who posts what I ate Wednesday and has the most flawless body? Yeah, unless the Lord lays hands on you, it ain't happening. So much of what you see is fake and actually the result of genetics. Influencers can tell you any of everything, but it doesn't make any of it true. Also, most of them don't follow their own advice or use the products they promote. It's all about taking your money. Pure alternative. Some people selling you intuitive eating in HAES are naturally thin and take advantage of you. So what's the difference? Edit. I am 100% sure they don't follow their own advice about intuitive eating as well. Why do doctors use the BMI chart when they know it's bogus? My doctor tells me I'm obese because my BMI is 44. Everybody I knows me is saying there is no way I'm obese. Yes, I'm a little chubby or even fat. But saying I'm obese is nuts. I'm six foot one, and that's why the BMI is 44. Plus, I always been a big guy, even when I wasn't chubby. My doctor always tells me to lose weight. Like most people, it's easy to lose weight, but hard to keep it off. My body fights back and puts the weight back on. 
The health problems overweight people comes from stress of dieting and feeling that we are lesser people because we are overweight. This is true for any abused group. Our society teaches us, if you are not white, straight, and thin, then you are not good enough. Forest lady, just for reference, a BMI of 44 on a 6 foot 1 person means they weigh 335 pounds. That is a lot more than a bit chubby. My brothers are a bit chubby and are pretty overweight at 200 to 230 pounds and roughly the same height. We need a full stop on the debate around recommending weight loss. In the world in general, and particularly in the eating disorder field, there is nothing to debate. It doesn't matter what medical issue someone has, or what size someone's body is, or whether they engage in movement or not. It doesn't matter what their family history is, or what their friends and family think. It doesn't matter if weight loss worked for you, or if you think it was necessary for you, or if you think it helped whatever health problem you had. It's not something to debate, it's truth. We don't need to see both sides or be nice. Stop harming people. Stop putting people in a position of having to defend their worth or internalize your weight stigma. And if you're in the eating disorder field and can't commit to never recommending, encouraging, praising, elevating weight loss, leave the field until you can stop doing harm. Phoenix no more. This is an angry, angry person and I feel sorry for them. They obviously suffered some sort of trauma and could not process it properly. They won't entertain any debate or even listen to differing viewpoints. What they were advocating was the truth. This kind of pig-headed arrogance is maddening because it's incredibly narcissistic and ridiculous. I vacillate between rage and pity for this person. People like these in general are responsible for the stupidification of the world. Miss Beaver, this is a scary thing found on the OP's professional website. I specialize in working with adolescents and adults who are struggling with all forms of eating disorders and disordered eating. Clients who come to see me may have just been diagnosed with an eating disorder or have been struggling for years. Some clients aren't sure if they have an eating disorder, but know they are struggling with food in their body. Clients often reach out to me because they know I practice from a health at every size framework, and they want treatment that is not stigmatizing about weight. Adolescent clients and their families often seek me out because of my expertise doing family-based treatment. I've been specialized in treating people with eating disorders for well over 10 years. I'm a certified body trust registered trademark provider and certified eating disorder specialist. I offer FBT and individual therapy for adolescents and individual therapy for adults. All treatment is weight inclusive, non-diet, trauma informed and fat positive. Struggling with an eating disorder, disordered eating or being stuck in diet culture is painful and life consuming. There are often incorrect messages in the media that healing is impossible which can leave people feeling hopeless. I hold space and hope for healing for my clients. I'm honored to join my clients on their journey toward healing. Auntie Apocalypse, who knew it was possible for blurbs to be punchable? It's okay to rest, cry, eat your feelings, have bad days. Eating your feelings is perfectly okay. Yes, totally valid coping mechanism. Female NPC 29. It's okay as long as you eat ice cream and cookies and chips. If you stress eat apple chips and cauliflower and almonds, you're disordered and need an intervention. Slash S, of course. Thin privilege is every mask pattern being designed with your face in mind. Yes, of course they can be modified, and yes, of course this is a minor annoyance in the grand scheme of things, so don't at me about it. Figuring out how to modify the available patterns is just one more hoop fat folks gotta jump through to be safe. Err. Cacophonous slurp. I started making masks last week, and the first one I made, straight from the pattern, was falling off my face. Fit my husband perfectly, though. Neither one of us is overweight, but the masks are one size fits all. So if you're even remotely outside the range of medium, it's not going to fit, whether you're big or small. I'm not even super small, just smaller than the average person this mask pattern was designed for. Know what I did? I resized the pattern to make it smaller so it would fit me. It's a face mask, not a ball gown. Took like five minutes. Your obituary won't read, she has defined abs, 20k Instagram followers, and x% body fat. 
It will talk about your relationships, your passions, your accomplishments, and the impact that you made. Without lamps, there'd be no light. It also won't talk about the joy you had while eating a dozen donuts or the couch that has your ass imprint. Does anyone else feel hungry even after eating plenty? I was eating dinner tonight, and I ate what I initially put on my plate and found myself still a little hungry. However, I had a hard time taking more, because I had just eaten an amount of food that probably would have filled the average person, and I felt a lot of guilt about taking more. This happens to me often, and I'm not sure how to cope. I want to honor my hunger cues, but sometimes doing so feels not normal. I also frequently find myself eating more than my boyfriend, which bugs me. Anyone else ever feel this way? How do I get past this? Sometimes we have a mental hunger that we need to fill, which is important to engage in. I know it's hard, but we need to focus less on what we think we should eat and what someone else eats and just focus on our own body's needs. If you still feel hungry, keep eating because your body's still trying to test and see what limits you're still trying to put on it. You may end up overly full for a while too, and that's okay as well. It gets easier over time once your body starts trusting you again. Heart. Some days I'm so hungry I can eat a horse, and I do. Lol. You'll be surprised how much your body needs. I wouldn't try to portion myself. Just eat if you're hungry and stop when you're full. Your body will start to adjust. Hi. I want to point out that you saying what you ate would probably have been enough for someone else is just a thought. It's not a true fact. Maybe you were just extra hungry, and you did an amazing job honoring that hunger. Some days you might find you eat more food than others. It's all normal. I would try to not feel bad about eating more than your boyfriend. It could send you down a rabbit hole of dieting and trigger you. Try not to compare. You're doing great. It will get easier in time, and you won't have these thoughts anymore. Benjo83 In high school, I knew some girls who would pressure their friends into joining them in destructive behavior, like smoking, dangerous drinking, drug use, and sleeping with strange guys. It was obvious that they pushed others into this excessive behavior, purely so they wouldn't feel so bad about doing it themselves. This honor your hunger BS is no different. It's fat women trying to normalize their destructive behavior. Before you DM me, this is how I built. And it's a picture of a pretty woman in a sports bra. I mean, the whole point of this trend was to let future booze partners that were not skinny lol. Like, before you DM me, this is how I'm built. An insert picture of a big stomach and some big thighs. It really doesn't make sense for a skinny person to do it because it's the norm. To me, the tweet is very insensitive and tone deaf, like, I'm not 100% sure that someone will love me for my body. Nothing in my body is small, lol. The great thing about being skinny is that y'all have the cushion. Society really gives an F about y'all. Also, I'm not saying I want to be skinny because I like my body, but the world treats y'all so much better, darn. And if any skinny people want to have a debate or a conversation about skinny shaming, I'm 100% interested in not having that conversation. It's okay to let another people talk, y'all. It doesn't always have to be about you. Also, I would like to say, F the norm, who the F cares? No, I'm not cute by the norm, but anyone who thinks I'm not cute is a liar. It doesn't matter what other people think. You're hot, cute, sexy, etc., and anyone that says otherwise is truly lying. Mads Frez. It's okay to let another people talk, y'all. It doesn't always have to be about you. The person retweeting someone's picture, just to shame them for not having the right body type. These coronavirus weight gain memes need to stop right effing now. Reagan. It doesn't matter if people think they are funny, if they are trying to call them therapy, spare me, or what justification people try to give us. These memes are harmful. They are harmful to fat people, they are harmful to people of all sizes dealing with eating disorders, and in people for whom they may trigger an eating disorder, who will have extremely restricted access to support. There is no excuse. Knock this stuff off. I called one out on Reddit for being fat phobic and got torn to shreds by other people calling me fat and lazy and unhealthy. I'm sorry, Reddit is a cesspool of bigotry based online bullying. Thank you, I never know what to do or say when people get so upset and angry. They think it's disgusting to promote such an unhealthy lifestyle. Paul's Reddit username. I'm just here waiting for Reagan to complete an Ironman triathlon. I think it's been five years now? I'm not here to troll. Reagan picked this fight. I didn't. She set out to prove that a fat person can accomplish any athletic feat that a thin person can. So far, all she's proved is that she can walk very slowly for a while, and then spend months recovering from the effort. 
Still waiting, Reagan. There's a lot more gray in my beard than when this journey started. Still waiting. Peeling a calorie count sticker off a vending machine and throwing it away. Me, this is a direct action against diet culture. Grillard. Vandalizes vending machine. Puts $4 in same vending machine. Feels smug about crushing patriarchal, capitalistic, white supremacist, homophobic fat phobia. As you read the picture, school is giving us homework to exercise two times a week and we have to write about it too. That's a perfect example of how the fitness culture is influencing us today. It's people's choice if they want to exercise or not, but school forcing us to do it is a huge no. Why must we follow this evil trend that teaches us to hate our bodies and live for others' why? School is involved in our personal lives in my opinion, like mind your own fuing business. They are doing this because they care about us. They want us to be healthy, stuff the F up, my body, my choice, mad, mad. Imagine trying to force somebody to exercise, sorry to break it for you, but I couldn't give 100 F-U-K-S's for my health. Unlike you, I love myself and I don't need to exercise. The Lori 24. I give no F's about my health. I love myself. These things don't seem to go together. Why you can't keep the weight off. What you're told. You failed. The real reason. Diets don't work. What you're told. You aren't motivated. The real reason. Diets don't work. What you're told. You didn't want it bad enough. The real reason. Diets don't work. What you're told. You have no self-control or willpower. Real reason. Diets don't work. I'm here to tell you that's BS. The reason you can't keep the weight off is not because you aren't motivated or lack self-control. It's because diets don't work in the long run. Red exclamation point. Red exclamation point. You may think the diet worked because in the beginning you may see some weight loss. But in the long run, the weight, and usually more of it, comes back. Individuals typically cannot maintain weight loss through restrictive dieting because deprivation ultimately triggers a biological starvation response in which neurological changes render food especially attention-grabbing, difficult to stop thinking about, and more rewarding to consume. Simultaneously, hormonal changes increase feelings of hunger and reduce one's sense of fullness and metabolic changes allow the body to sustain itself on fewer calories, resulting in greater fat storage. The diet industry wants your money, period. It's the only industry that sells a product that does not work and then blames the consumer. It's the perfect plan. You think it's your fault, so you continue to spend your money on a broken product. Lies, lies, lies. It's not your fault. Diets don't work cries in planes trains. Yes, it is your fault if you don't lose weight on a diet. Take responsibility for your life. It's your fault for not seeking out good advice. And the only person you are BSing here when you say you do or tried everything is yourself. I hear the obese in the office talking about going on a diet and what diet to do. And they talk exclusively with each other. Never ask the 10 or so that have lost significant weight over the last few years. It's your fault you're not tracking your intake and don't have a clue what your output is. Can't spend the three minutes it takes to find your TDEE estimate? Can't spend the ten minutes or so that it takes to track your calories at first? Some sanity. Fat loss happens gradually, eating in a calorie deficit. Strength happens gradually, lifting more weight and or reps each workout. Muscle gain happens gradually, combining strength with a calorie surplus. Patience is your strongest weapon. Being obese or even overweight, what I am defining as fat, has definite effects on one's health at baseline. COVID-19, which affects primarily the respiratory and cardiac functions of severely infected patients, puts further physiological stress on supposedly healthy fat people, making it more difficult for healthy care teams to care for them, and increasing morbidity and mortality among these patients. Here's an incomplete list detailing why. Airway. When we as anesthesiologists or intensivists need to insert a breathing device, a process called intubation, we give drugs to put the patient to sleep, pry a patient's mouth open, insert a viewing device that lets us see the vocal cords, and insert a tube through that small hole into the trachea. When you are fat, a couple of things affect our ability to intubate. Most fat folks have small mouths, making it difficult to open the mouth, insert our instruments, and get a good view. Most fat folks have redundant tissue in their mouths, also making it difficult to navigate to the small opening we seek. A lot of fat man grow beards to look less fat. This makes it difficult to place a breathing mask and get a good seal to deliver oxygen by face mask, if that becomes necessary. Most fat people have thick necks and, as mentioned earlier, redundant tissue in the oropharynx. 
which also makes it difficult to push air into the lungs using a mask because that extra neck tissue closes the upper airway. Pulmonary. Once we get the breathing tube in, we then need to apply airway pressure to the lungs to get them to inflate. So oxygen can be supplied and carbon dioxide can be removed. Oxygenation and ventilation respectively. Coronavirus patients frequently have thickened stiff lungs due to the virus and the resulting inflammatory response. Fat people already have a restrictive type of lung pathology due to all the weight they have to breathe against, especially when lying flat. Our ventilators can only handle, and in the type of lung disease coronavirus patients get, we only want to deliver, a certain pressure of oxygen. If you are fat, we are thus further limited in our vent management. Fat people also have decreased functional residual capacity. The amount of gas left in your lungs after exhalation that actually still contributes to exchange of oxygen and CO2. This means there is less reserve in fat people. They can't go even short periods without a high concentration of oxygen, or their blood levels of oxygen will decrease rapidly. This means when we are intubating, we have to be very fast putting the tube in while the patient is not breathing. As mentioned above, it can be difficult to intubate fat people because of the airway issues they frequently have. Therefore, with fat patients, we have less time to perform a more difficult procedure. If they do not get enough oxygen during the intubation process, they can go into cardiac arrest. People who are fat are also likelier to have obstructive sleep apnea and obesity hypoventilation syndrome, both of which cause an imbalance in oxygen and CO2 levels at their baseline. Again, for the treatment of coronavirus, any deficit, especially in oxygenation, a patient has before even the virus has begun its process, is a huge initial setback for healthcare providers who are treating these patients. Cardiovascular. Fat tissue is essentially an oxygen and nutrition sink. Keeping all that fat tissue alive requires diverting resources, for example oxygen, from organs that really need them, heart, lungs, brain, kidneys. Therefore, fat people will have higher baseline metabolic rates. You can imagine that when someone gets coronavirus, their bodies are in overdrive trying to fight the infection. At the same time, they are getting much less oxygen because the virus causes scarring in the lungs and decreases oxygen exchange. So fat people who at baseline require more oxygen are at high risk of damage to other organs when oxygen levels become low, which they inevitably will be in severe COVID-19 infection. Add to this that the virus seems to affect the heart as well, causing a cardiomyopathy or weakness of the heart. Now you have low oxygen in the blood and a broken pump that cannot push oxygen carrying blood around, a lethal combo for a fat person who really needs all the oxygen they can get. Associated comorbidities. Fat people, even those claiming to be healthy fat, are much more likely to have diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, etc. All of which have been shown in increase the morbidity and mortality of patients who get infected with COVID. I say all these not to be vitriolic to people who believe they are healthy fat, but rather to educate and maybe change some minds. I myself am not the healthiest person out there, but I am hoping to use this awfulness of the coronavirus pandemic to better myself and make some basic changes to improve my overall baseline health. So when coronavirus does finally infect me, I have given my body a good chance to fight back. This is an update to the story about the man whose wife was almost 400 pounds and seemed to have already given up on life. A couple of edits first. She's 38 now, and I also found out her weight is 522 pounds. Not nearly 400, over 500. This was shocking to see. I guess once you pass 300, 100 pounds, give or take, doesn't even look any different. I initiated a trial separation a few weeks ago, after I posted. I also found an attorney. That came after attempting a final come-to-Jesus talk informed by some of the advice I had received. She took it as poorly as she'd taken all my other attempts to talk to her about her weight and eating habits. To my decision to separate, she reacted explosively, blaming it on things that were never true. Such as I'm a misogynist, or must be cheating with a younger woman. Due to her anger, she threw things at me. Nothing that hurt, but for the first time I felt afraid of her. I quickly packed my essentials and moved out. This was a bit after Valentine's Day, which was not what I would have ever imagined for the holiday, but so it goes. When COVID-19 started to really take root, I was already out. We live in New York City and staying with my sister's family in upstate New York. My job in software development can easily be done remotely. Once I left, my wife began texting, calling, and emailing nonstop. I got hateful messages from people I don't know on Facebook. So did my sister. And some of those people even found her husband and 15-year-old daughter. This all crossed a serious line, and my entire family as well as myself now have her and anyone who found us on her behalf blocked. 
in her own messages and texts to me. My wife was swinging between begging me to come back with apologies for being such a horrible person and insulting me that I am too weak for her anyway. And she can find plenty of men, but no woman will look past my toxic BS. And she'll expose who I really am to anyone I try to date. As I said, we blocked her on social media, but I didn't block on my phone. After all, I will need a way to get in contact with her once this blows over and courts reopen. Because I did decide after those stunts to go through with the divorce. But I ended up needing to block her number too. I'd already muted her texts. And it seemed like she was wearing herself out, but then a few weeks ago she began blowing up my phone at all hours. She demanded I needed to get her upstate with me or she was going to die. I recognized this as guilt tripping. So thank you to everyone who showed me the ways my wife had been manipulating me. I felt like I was seeing clearly for the first time. She claimed all sorts of other things like that she couldn't move, had no food, was trapped in the apartment because the National Guard is keeping people inside. Just a lot of nonsense. She also said she had the virus, even though she hardly ever goes outside, let alone to a doctor. She was calling every few hours leaving messages and saying that I need to help her, and I finally blocked her number. I have not heard from her since shortly after that. Email is the only place I didn't block for any future divorce-related communication, and her last email was around a couple weeks ago, so I'm relieved that stopped. I've been working remotely and enjoying spending time with my family. My sister and brother-in-law have been incredible supporters in my life right now. They've helped me find the strength not to cave in. They've been by my side for most of the guilting messages showing me what it looks like to not fall for manipulation. A lot of you recommended me to start therapy. I did go to the first two appointments, but then ended leaving New York City, as I said. To be honest, I haven't contacted the office to see if I can continue with online sessions. I don't have any good excuses, just focusing on adjusting the things, I guess. I know I need to get back to it, and I will. What I'm still struggling with is guilt that I should have been able to fix this. Although a lot of you have explained how that's irrational, I still feel it. I'm fighting the urge to run back to what I'm used to. I'm also struggling with who I even am as a single man. I have no relationship experience besides her. What do I want out of life? Will I ever be able to date again? If I have Asperger's, then that's a mark against me. But even if not, could I risk another relationship when I now know she could end up becoming what my wife did? I couldn't go through this again. And lastly, I just don't get it. Some of you said my wife had an addiction due to past trauma, which was a really unfamiliar way of looking at it to me. For one, she never hinted at any sort of trauma. For two, I can understand drugs or alcohol because they chemically put you in a different mental state that let you escape from whatever's troubling you. But food is just food. It doesn't have any mind-altering effect like that. It just makes you fat. So you're still aware of your demons and you've piled on hundreds of pounds. What is the point? 